Renault's revitalised Kajar takes a very class competitive engineering formula and develops it just that little bit further in this improved form. This SUV is now better primed for petrol power, plus it's smarter both inside and out. It's only a more interesting family choice than that focus class hatch you might have been considering. And there's the option of four wheel drive if you want some substance to go with the style. Renault's Kajar is a family-sized SUV that's smart, sensible, and in its way, quite aspirational. Mindful of the close competition in this segment, the French brand revised it significantly in late 2018, and it's that improved version we're going to test here. It took Renault a long time to get on board with a properly class-competitive mid-sized family SUV. This Kajar model, the brand's first such contender, has only been around since 2015 when it was launched as the family hatch-based big brother to the French maker's popular super mini-based capture crossover. Prior to that, the French maker's attempts to make real inroads in the family section of the SUV segment had proved notably unsuccessful. We had various off-road orientated versions of the scenic MPV, plus there was the unloved first generation Coleus SUV launched in 2007, but soon withdrawn from sale. That year, 2007, was when Renault was shown what that Coleus model ought to have been. Their alliance partner, Nissan, launched a crossover called the Qashqai that quickly came to define family SUV motoring. And when that car was redesigned in 2014, Renault had another go at creating their own version of it. The Kajar was the result. This time, the Gallic maker managed to deliver a contender much closer to what the market wanted. And as a result, over 450,000 Kajars were sold in over 50 countries in this model's first four years on sale. Buyers were particularly taken by the smart looks, the comfort orientated demeanour and the fact that a four wheel drive option was much more affordable than it was on a Qashqai. They weren't quite so enamoured by the relative inefficiency of the ageing 1.2 litre TCE turbo unit provided to power petrol versions, which was a problem given the market's increasing militant preference against diesels. On top of that, by 2018, improvements were also needed to match more recently launched segment rivals in areas like cabin quality, media connectivity and safety provision. Renault claims to have addressed all of these things with this much improved Kajar model. Plus, there are upgraded diesel engines and smarter exterior looks. Will it all be enough to keep this car class competitive? Let's find out. This, we're told, is the ultimate urban adventurer. It's certainly a good indicator as to just how far the family SUV has come. There's no real acclimatization necessary in getting to grips with a Kajar. Indeed, were it not for the slightly raised driving position, you really could be in an ordinary family hatchback like Renault's Megane, or indeed a Focus or an Astra. And there's not much chance of urban adventure in one of those. Here, in contrast, your ordinary motoring can be enlivened by an activity-orientated vehicle that on first acquaintance seems to have a few dynamic downsides, hence, of course, the popularity of this class of car. Of course, SUV customers shouldn't get carried away. For all the brochure bragging, this Renault is, like its contemporaries, little more than a family hatchback in a pair of hiking boots, offering lifestyle looks without any of the compromises you won't want to make if you never go off-road. So curbs can be mounted, but you'll need to leave the Serengeti to run a fines, especially if, like nearly all customers for this model, you opt for a front-wheel drive variant. That's the kind of Kajar we're trying here, and on the move it feels entirely fit for purpose. We approve of the fact that Renault hasn't felt the need to try and make it sporty. Instead, the suspension has been tuned towards the kind of ride comfort that will suit this car's urban remit, though really harsh bumps can still be keenly felt. 
The flip side of this approach is that this Renault isn't quite as responsive as its Nissan Qashqai cousin would be at speeds through the turns, but it hangs on well and body roll is decently controlled. Push really hard and you can unsettle it in a way that would be harder to do in a conventional family hatch, but you'd have to be driving in a totally untypical way in order to do that. We'll come back to this, but first we need, of course, to get to the changes that make this mildly facelifted Kajar model different. Most of them lie under the bonnet, where Renault's taken the opportunity to modernise the entire range. Petrol power was previously this car's Achilles heel, the original model having carried forward a 1.2-litre TCE unit that had previously seen service in the Megane hatch for the best part of a decade. So that's been dispensed with and replaced by an all-new 1.3-litre TCE power plant that Renault's developed with Mercedes, which is what we're trying here. Given that this engine is one of the primary units used by the French brand's little Clio Super Mini, you might think it could struggle a little, dragging well over 1.3 tonnes of Kajar about. Actually, though, it really seems quite punchy, even in base 140 horsepower form, delivering everything it's got from just 1600 RPM, which gives a decently responsive feel right from the off. The same enthusiasm continues into the mid-range and 62 miles an hour is dispatched from rest in 10.4 seconds en route to 126 miles an hour. That's if you're quick with the six-speed manual gear shift, which isn't easy because it's rather notchy. If that's an issue, your dealer will offer you a seven-speed twin-clutch EDC auto transmission as an option. If you want a bit more performance, you can upgrade your petrol-powered Kajar from TCE 140 to TCE 160 status, which, as the numerology suggests, means that you get 160 rather than 140 horsepower. It's the TCE 160 variant we're trying here, but if Renault hadn't told us that, we might have struggled to notice the difference over the base petrol model. That's because the extra power and torque developed by this uprated unit are both delivered higher up the rev range, where you'll rarely venture. All of this is reflected by the very marginal gains you get in the performance figures. The rest to 62 mile an hour sprint time in this TCE 160 model is just half a second quicker than the base variant and top speed increases by only 4 miles an hour. Buyers of the original Kajar primarily preferred diesel power, but just 30% of them are expected to choose the 1.5-litre DCI unit this time round, now upgraded with better sound insulation and an AdBlue selective catalyst to reduce particulate emissions. Plus, there's also a fraction more power, hence the new blue DCI 115 badging. We still can't help thinking that this engine might be the sweet spot in the range, though. It delivers its power smoothly and is even gutsier from low revs than the TCE unit, despite the fact that it doesn't have much more in terms of ultimate torque. The performance stats are a touch slower, though, 62 miles an hour from rest, occupying 11.7 seconds en route to 117 miles an hour. Again, there's a 7-speed EDC auto transmission option if you want it. Only if you'll regularly be venturing over longer distances or you expect to be towing with this Renault will you really need the alternative diesel engine offered to Kajar buyers, a 1.7-litre blue DCI unit that fronts up with 150 horsepower and which can offer a 1,800 kilo braked towing capacity. This engine can be had with this model's usual front-driven format, but it's also available paired up with four-wheel drive, the only power plant in the range that can be. You'll need to take up that option if you want your Kajar to have any sort of slippery surface capability because Renault UK, rather disappointingly, has chosen not to offer buyers of front-driven Kajar variants the brand's optional extended grip system. This is a useful setup that Continental buyers can pay extra for, which gives you grippier mud and snow tyres and various selectable traction settings provided in conjunction with tweaks to the ESP system. Of course, a Kajar equipped with four-wheel drive is much more capable than that, and in fact a lot more capable than you might expect it to be, courtesy of a 4x4 setup borrowed from Renault's alliance partner Nissan, who've deleted it from their rival Qashqai model. 
As usual on such cars, it's a part-time system, the layout being one of those that keeps you in front-wheel drive most of the time, but which can instantly react to a loss of traction and send up to 50% of drive to the rear wheels when necessary. Leave the setup in its auto mode and it'll make all the decisions for you. But if you do want to intervene, you can set the car to run only in front wheel drive or put it in a lock mode with 50% of power going to either end of the car should you end up with your Kajar somewhere you really shouldn't have ventured in the first place. In that scenario, you'll have a better chance of extricating yourself than most mid-sized SUVs would offer, thanks to this car's 200 millimeters of ground clearance and reasonable approach and departure angles of 18 and 25 degrees, respectively. If you can stretch to the blue DCI 150 engine, one of the advantages of doing so is that this variant gets much more sophisticated independent rear suspension, rather than the more conventional twist beam setup of the other models in the range. As we suggested earlier though, even the supposedly cruder damping package we're trying here delivers supple fluidity over uneven surfaces. In other words, you'll like it on the school run, even with the big 19-inch alloy wheels that come fitted to most models. This Renault works well on highway trips too, thanks to decent levels of refinement. The more commanding driving position than you get in a family hatch is naturally welcome in urban motoring, as is the light steering, though you won't appreciate this quite so much when you're cornering at speed. Feedback and feel at this point is rather vague, though if you can push on through this, there's actually more traction than you'd expect. That's thanks in part to what Renault calls understeer logic control, basically a torque vectoring system that applies the brakes to individual wheels to help the car hold its line through the turns. As suggested earlier, this car still doesn't change direction as swiftly as an ordinary family hatch, but as is likely you don't care much about that, then what's provided here represents a very acceptable dynamic compromise. If you're a typical Kajar buyer, that's probably all you'll really want. So, what do we have here? A Nissan Qashqai with a Renault restyle or something more? Well, the Kajar certainly shares much with its Japanese design stablemate, primarily its CMF or Common Module Family platform and most of its engine technology. Many, though, will think this to be a more sleekly styled car, and it's certainly a more practical one, with a rear overhang lengthened to deal with the Qashqai's biggest problem, a lack of boot space. The result is an appealing package that at first glance seems to deliver everything that a modern mid-sized SUV of this kind should offer. Renault admits that 60% of this car's parts are shared with its Nissan cousin, but claims that 95% of what you see and feel with this Kajar is unique to this model. Visually, as you might expect, it shares quite a lot with the French brand's smaller Capture SUV, especially here at the front, where the two cars are very similar indeed. Changes have been made here with this revised Kajar, though you'd probably have to be a salesperson or a real brand enthusiast to notice them. The grille is slightly wider and can now feature chrome slats on top variants. Plus, there are new cutout sections for reshaped fog lamps that can feature full LED technology. All this has meant the need for a restyled bumper, which now features a larger area of body-coloured paintwork. Below, the silver lower skid plate that features on plusher models has been revised, plus LED indicators have been incorporated into the daytime running lights. As before, the headlamps can feature full LED beams on top models. In profile, changes are limited to fresh designs for the 17 and 19-inch wheels. We've got 19-inch diamond-cut Zeus alloy rims here. Avoid entry-level trim and you get aluminium-look roof rails and this chrome strip in the lower body side moulding, which curves gracefully into the flanks and separates these black plastic-clad wheel arches. Of more importance than all this tinsel is the size of this car. It's 4.45 metre length making it a full 327 millimetres longer than a Capture and 72 millimetres longer than a Qashqai. Despite that, the Kajar is still a pretty compact roadway footprint that's shorter and thinner than rivals like Ford's Cougar and Mazda's CX-5. 
It certainly looks quite dynamic thanks to the low roof line and these strongly sculpted shoulder lines that flow back below the C pillars. At the back, the indicators gain LEDs, as do the reversing lights and the fog lamps, which are now built into the restyled bumper. Below that, top models get a smarter lower skid plate too. This subtle roof spoiler is standard, and on most variants, you get this shark fin roof antenna too. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see, namely the light, stiff, sophisticated CMF or common module family vehicle platform that this car shares not only with its Qashqai cousin, but also with Renault's Megane family hatch. Time to take a seat behind the wheel, where Renault hopes you'll notice the attention to detail that characterises the look and feel of this cabin, an approach that's even extended to the stylized iPod-like design of the key card you get above entry-level trim. There's certainly a higher quality ambience than there was before, as you'd expect there might be, given that unusually for a facelift, the fascia and the centre console have been completely redesigned, with most of the changes featuring here on the centre stack. Renault's rather proud of this new dual-zone climate control panel, which on all models delivers these three smart circular climate control dials with incorporated digital readouts that look rather like the ones you get on a Jaguar I-Pace. Just above, the infotainment screen is now flush-fitting and extends the width of the centre console panel. It's disappointing, though, that the actual functioning part of the display is no larger than it was 7 inches in size, particularly as a humble Renault Clio Super Mini these days has a monitor that's at least 9.3 inches. Of course, there's a slightly higher feeling of quality than there would be in a Clio. This enhanced Kajar embellished with satin chrome touches on the air vents, the door handles and the centre console. The restyled door panels get smarter backlit controls for the windows and mirrors. And provided you avoid entry level trim, you get this classy quilted style seat fabric, partly trimmed in synthetic leather. Proper leather features, of course, at the top of the range, now offered in an optional lighter shade if you can't bear all the unremitting black. Talking of seats, they've been redesigned as part of the facelift and now include double density foam to reduce fatigue on longer journeys, plus extra side support. With full leather upholstery, you get cushion length adjustment too, and all models get this adjustable sliding centre armrest. Otherwise, things are much as they were previously. Not all mid-sized SUVs fully emphasise the slightly higher seating position that's supposed to help define this class of car, but this one does, positioning you quite commandingly in front of this smart, soft-touch dashboard. As before, on all variants, through the three-spoke wheel, you view a 7-inch TFT colour instrument screen that partly replaces conventional dials and can be configured in either of four different display modes. The first two layouts show a rev counter in either white or red and give you a digital speedo. The third option gives you an eco driving meter and the fourth prioritises an analogue style speedometer. It would be much more configurable if the centre digital screen could be stretched the width of the instrument binnacle. Still, this is what we've got. Anything this display can't tell you will probably be covered off by the 7-inch colour infotainment monitor we mentioned earlier, which now features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring as standard across the range. Provided you avoid base trim, you get Renault's R-Link 2 setup, which gives the monitor touchscreen functionality, voice control, navigation and TomTom Tom Live services for things like European mapping and speed camera locations, along with a useful Driving Eco 2 menu that grades you on the efficiency of your progress and gives you economy tips. Our link also allows you to use text-to-speak messaging and surf the internet so that you can download a range of Renault-sourced apps for things like email, Facebook, Twitter news and fuel prices. That all works quite well, but we still find this infotainment screen to be positioned a touch lower down the fascia than we would ideally like. You have to take your eyes off the road to use it. And we miss the physical volume knob that was provided with the previous setup. 
While we're grousing, the gear lever feels a little cheap. There's a chintzy chime at start-up. The start button is obscured by the indicator stalk, and it seems a bit mean that entry-level variants have to do without driver's seat lumbar support. Otherwise, though, there are few cabin issues. The materials used around the cabin are quite nice, though hard. More brittle plastics do inevitably feature lower down the dash. Build quality from the Spanish factory seems reasonable, and practicality certainly seems to have been carefully considered. Renault claiming that there's over 30 litres of interior storage room, which means plenty of spaces to store phones, coffee cups and smaller bottles. The door bins are larger on this revised Kajar, now big enough to take a 1.5 litre bottle. And glory be, we've at last got a volume brand French-made family model that's managed to make the transition to right-hand drive without donating half of its glove box space to a fuse box. At the bottom of the centre stack is a storage area, presumably intended for your phone, hence the provision of 12 volt, aux in and twin USB ports. There's a coin tray behind the gear lever and twin cup holders behind that. The top of the sliding armrest mentioned earlier lifts to reveal a drop down tray with a pen clip, while beneath that is a deep box with a slot for credit cards, though Renault hasn't thought to cool it for drinks or add in any connectivity ports that would allow you to charge devices away from prying eyes. There's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses, but if you avoid entry-level trim, you do get a ticket flap and an illuminated mirror built into the driver's sun visor. Time to try the rear. Now, as usual in a car of this kind, it's comfortable for two adults, but a little bit of a squash for three. Headroom, though, is fine, unless you've a top model fitted with Renault's fixed panoramic roof, in which case really tall folk might be a touch restricted. If you really do need to take three adults back here, it's easier than is the case in some rivals, thanks to this low centre transmission tunnel and the fact that the middle part of the bench doesn't force you to sit on an uncomfortably raised section of foam. A little disappointingly, this rear bench doesn't slide back and forth in the way that it does on Renault's smaller Captur SUV, nor does the backrest recline. These emissions couldn't be corrected as part of the facelift, but on most variants, Renault has added the centre air vents and a couple of twin USB ports for rear seat folk, both things omitted on many rivals. Seat back pockets, small door bins, coin cubbies in the door pulls and a centre armrest with twin cup holders are also provided. Overall, it's certainly slightly more spacious back here than it is in this car's Qashqai cousin, though that has more to do with seat sculpting rather than the provision of any extra legroom. Despite this Renault's longer bodywork, the two cars actually have exactly the same wheelbase length. Where this car's extra body length does pay dividends is out back. Now, rather surprisingly, there's still no option for a powered tailgate. But once you pull up the hatch, instead of the slightly restricted 430-litre boot you get in that Nissan model, there's a 472-litre trunk on offer here once you get your stuff over the rather high boot lip. The total provided is about average for the class, significantly more than you'd get in, say, a Ford Cougar, but quite a bit less space than you'd find in something like a Mazda CX-5 or a Volkswagen Tiguan. In terms of the weight of the items you can carry, Renault quotes a payload of 549 kilograms. And you can make the most of it if you avoid entry-level trim and get yourself a Kajar with this neat multi-positional boot floor. As you can see, it's divided into a couple of parts which can be repositioned at a lower level or clipped into slots so that you can separate different elements of your load across the boot floor. There's no more significant storage space beneath the boot floor despite the fact that Renault doesn't provide a standard spare wheel. Two bag hooks are provided, but there's only a couple of tie-down points. Renault doesn't offer a ski hatch either, or a 40-20-40 rear backrest folding option. What you can have though, providing you avoid entry-level trim, is a feature quite a few rivals make you do without. Cargo sidewall catches to release the rear backrest so you don't have to stretch up to the seat shoulders, or even worse, have to go round and tug on levers embedded in the seats 
every time you want to drop the rear bench. Now tug on these catches and Renault's Easy Life setup drops the 60-40 split bench efficiently, though doesn't leave it laying quite flat. Still, in this configuration, 1,478 litres of space is opened up, although rather curiously, that figure is actually 107 litres less than you'd get in a Qashqai. There's no option for a fold-flat front passenger seat, and if luggage provision is important to you, we'd suggest you specify the all-in-one boot liner that sits on the options list. Kajar pricing sits in the 21 to £30,000 bracket. In other words, exactly what you'd pay for most other mid-sized family hatch-based SUV models of this kind in the Qashqai class. Virtually all Kajars come in front-driven only form and there are four decently equipped trim levels. Play, this iconic spec model, which probably represents the sweet spot in the range, then S edition and top GT line. Most buyers will be choosing between the base 1.3 litre TCE 140 petrol engine and the 1.5 litre blue DCI 115 diesel. There's a £1,900 premium to go from one to the other. Whichever unit you decide upon, you'll be offered the option of spending £1,500 more to get your car with EDC auto transmission. If it's the petrol engine you prefer, you'd like a manual gearbox and you're avoiding entry-level trim, your dealer will want you to consider the £800 premium necessary to get the 1.3-litre TCE engine in the uprated TCE 160 form we're trying here. We're not sure we'd bother. The difference between the two units is quite marginal and you can't have this TCE 160 variant with auto transmission. The only other option in the range lies at the priciest end of it, the 1.7-litre DCI 150 diesel engine, which only comes with top GT line trim, hence a starting price tag of around £28,000. This is the unit you'll need if you want your Kajar with four-wheel drive, which will cost you £2,000 more. Before we get into the value proposition those prices offer in this Kajar's chosen segment, we'll position it for you from a Renault range perspective. There's a premium of around £3,500 to go from the brand's smaller capture SUV to this car, but if you happen to be looking at the top DCI 160 diesel two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive Kajar variants, it's worth pointing out that exactly the same kind of money could get you into two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive versions of the company's significantly larger Colios SUV model, which we can't help thinking would be a better bet. Away from SUVs, the same sort of interior space as you get from this Kajar could be provided with almost exactly the same engineering by equivalent versions of Renault's more conventional Megane Sport Tourer estate model for £1,500 to £2,000 less, so you've really got to want this SUV design's crossover vibe. But there's no doubt that the market does. So how does this Kajar stack up price and value-wise against the huge number of volume brand competitors it must face in the mid-sized SUV segment? Well, let's see. The obvious place to start is with the car that shares its engineering, Nissan's Qashqai. Entry-level Vizier trimmed Qashqai models undercut base play spec Kajars by 500 to 1,000 pounds. But that's not really a fair comparison because Vizier trim really is a stripped out basic spec. The next rung up in the Qashqai range is a centre premium and the equipment level you get there is much more comparable to what you'd find on a base Kajar Play model. If that's your point of comparison, you'll find that a Kajar could save you £2,000 to £2,500 over a Qashqai, which really is a decent saving, particularly as this Renault has a larger boot. Much the same sort of argument applies to the other really strong seller in this segment, say it's Attica. At first glance, this Spanish container seems to undercut this Renault significantly by one and a half to two thousand pounds, but that's base spec to base spec. You need to go one rung up in the Attica trim hierarchy to get a level of equipment comparable to what you'd find in a base play spec Kajar, at which point pricing between the two cars is much the same. Also comparably priced is another strong seller in this segment, the Kia Sportage. The Korean car might save you a few hundred in diesel form, but would come with higher running costs that would quickly delete that difference. 
as for other popular mid-sized volume branded SUVs in this segment, well, you'd probably pay £700 to £800 more for an equivalent Skoda Karok and £1,500 to £2,000 more for comparable versions of cars like Hyundai's Tucson, Peugeot 3008, Vauxhall's Grandland X and Citroën's C5 Aircross. Perhaps we haven't yet mentioned the alternative volume-branded mid-sized SUVs you might have had in mind as a potential alternative to this Renault, so we'll do so now. Some are cheaper than this Renault because they come from budget brand makers. Into this category for class entrants like the MG GS or the Ssangyong Tivoli XLV, SUVs that simply don't have the style or the build quality to interest a typical Kajar buyer. Slightly nicer SUV models like Mitsubishi's ASX, the Suzuki Vitara and the Suzuki S-Cross will all save you significant money over this Renault, but are really a touch too small to properly compete with it and lack this car's polish. Volkswagen's T-Roc and the Honda HR-V deliver that and would probably give you a saving of around £1,500 over what's on offer here, but again, they aren't really family-sized inside. Nor, by the way, is the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross, which will probably cost you a few hundred pounds more than a Kajar. All the other mid-sized SUV options that do give you decent rear seat and luggage space, and which might spring to mind in this category, will cost you significantly more than this Renault. A Ford Cougar, a Volkswagen Tiguan, a Mini Countryman, or a Mazda CX-5 will typically all cost around two and a half to three thousand pounds more. Think typically in terms of around £4,000 or so more for most versions of mid-sized SUVs like Honda's CRV and the Jeep Compass. A Toyota RAV4, now only offered in hybrid form, starts from up around £30,000 these days. And premium branded mid-sized SUV models in this category, which tend to be smaller than this Renault inside, typically sit in the £27,000 to £35,000 bracket. Cars like the Mercedes GLA, the Volvo XC40, the Audi Q3, the BMW X1 and the Lexus UX. Enough with the options. If having considered them all, you conclude that it is a Kajar that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous the French brand has been when it comes to the specification. Well, let's see. Entry-level play variants come with 17-inch Athena alloy wheels, tinted rear windows, auto headlamps and wipers, LED daytime running lights, rear parking sensors and a category one alarm. Inside, there's automatic dual zone climate control, a digital instrument display, a height adjustable driver's seat and cruise control with a speed limiter. Infotainment's taken care of by a seven inch central screen with a four speaker DAB audio system, Bluetooth and Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Most, though, will want to find the £1,500 premium necessary to graduate up to a mid-range iconic trim level that we have here that opens up the further option of the perkier TCE 160 petrol engine and gives you quite a lot more. It'll stand out a bit more in your driveway thanks to larger 19-inch diamond-cut Zeus alloy wheels, chrome-look roof rails, darker tinted windows, chrome strips in the body side moulding and a shark fin roof antenna. At this level, you also get front parking sensors, power folding mirrors, a rear view camera and automatic high and low beam headlamps that dip themselves at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Inside, in iconic variants, stitched synthetic leather lines the steering wheel and combines with cloth trim on the seats. The driver's seat gets lumbar adjustment, while the front passenger seat gains height adjustment. Rear seat folk gain air vents and a couple of USB ports. Plus, the infotainment system gets a big upgrade to R-Link 2 status, which means it comes with touchscreen functionality and gains satellite navigation, voice control, TomTom Live services and higher quality Archimis 3D sound. There are a couple of important practical additions too at this level. The multi-positional boot floor and the Easy Life quick folding rear seats, which can be operated by catches on the side walls of the luggage bay. 
If you want more, your next option is one of the S edition models, recognisable by their full LED headlamps, satin grey front and rear skid plates, and LED front fog lamps that sit in chromed surrounds. Inside, S edition variants gain dark blue 3D stitching for the part synthetic leather seats, plus a fixed glass panoramic sunroof and an auto dimming rear view mirror. Finally, at the very top of the range, there's GT line trim, which, as we said, is what you'll need if you want the blue DCI 150 engine and or four wheel drive. Here you get even more stylish Poseidon design alloy wheels, smarter adamantium trimmed front and rear skid plates and chrome trimming for the front grille slats. Inside, there's real leather for the steering wheel and for seats that at the front feature heating and a cushion length extender. Plus, there's electric adjustment for the driver's seat, a hands-free parking system that automatically steers your Kajar into spaces, and an upgraded seven-speaker Bose audio system. And some extra camera-driven safety features we'll get to in a moment. On to options. Now, unlike the premium brands, Renault doesn't offer hundreds of extra cost features, preferring that customers wanting more kit should simply move up a trim grade. However, there are some extras your dealer will want you to consider. Paintwork is almost certainly something you'll be paying extra for, since the only colour that comes as standard is solid glacier white. A range of extra cost metallic colours is available, or for a fraction more, you can also opt for even brighter ID paint, like the flame red shade we have here. Three fresh colours, Aural Green, Iron Blue and Highland Grey, have joined the paint shade range. The other thing you really should pay extra for is an emergency space saver spare wheel. That's if you don't want to be stuck by the side of the road fiddling with a tyre inflation kit in the event of a puncture, because that's all that's provided as standard. What else? Well, you might like the idea of luxury touches like sports pedals, illuminated door sill plates or premium carpet mats. And if you want, you can add a wireless phone charger and a Kenwood dash cam that starts recording as soon as the ignition's turned on. On GT line variants, a lighter colour of leather upholstery can also be optioned in. You might also be interested in a range of practical extras, holders that clip onto the backs of the front seat headrests, onto which you can clip tablets to entertain the kids in the back, or maybe one of the boot liners. You can get one with an end that folds out to protect the bumper lip. There's a pet pack that combines a boot liner with a partition grille, and an explore pack that combines a retractable tow bar and a Euro ride carrier, which can take two bikes. Plus, you can add a roof box if you want one. On to safety features. Like other Renaults, this one achieved a full five-star Euro NCAP safety rating, helped by a tough, rigid body shell construction and a pretty complete roster of safety provision. That Euro NCAP rating, though, was achieved in 2015 before that organisation started docking points away from cars that didn't include autonomous braking as a standard fit item across the range. We're disappointed that Renault hasn't taken the opportunity to do this here. In fact, you can't have autonomous braking at all on a Kajar unless you go for pricey top-spec GT line trim where it's standard. If you're interested in knowing about current tech camera-driven safety features you can have, well, there aren't any with entry-level play spec, but if you can afford to move up a rung to this mid-range iconic model, then you get lane departure warning and, as we mentioned earlier, an automatic high and low beam system for the headlamps. But that's it until you get to GT line spec, which, as well as the AEBS, or Active Emergency Braking System, gets a blind spot warning set up, which alerts you if you're about to dangerously pull out into the path of an oncoming vehicle. GT line variants also get a new addition for this revised model, a clever overspeed feature that works with traffic sign recognition and the vehicle speed limiter, ensuring that you don't exceed the limit of the speed sign you just passed. Otherwise, safety provision is limited to pretty standard stuff. All models get twin front, side and curtain airbags, though no driver's knee bag, plus the usual electronic aids for braking, traction and stability control. Isofix child seat fastenings, tyre pressure monitoring and hill start assist 
to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions are all additional features that make the team sheet. It's almost certain that this revised Kajar model is cleaner and more economic than the original version, but the stats don't show it because these days they're measured using the much stricter WLTP or World Harmonised Light Vehicle Test Procedure Cycle. You'd think that there'd be an improvement because so much work has gone into enhancing engine technology since this car was first launched, primarily in developing the ultra-modern 1.3 TCE petrol unit we're trying here. This engine's fitted with a GPF petrol particulate filter that destroys particles in the exhaust gases by trapping them in a microporous honeycomb structure that regenerates automatically at regular intervals. Work has also gone into modernising the blue DCI diesel engines which get a selective catalytic reduction system to deal with nitrogen oxide NOx emissions. Plenty of SUVs in this segment though feature sophisticated engineering but are ultimately hobbled in terms of fuel consumption and emissions by one thing, weight. Peruse the stats and you'll find that most mid-size models of this sort have a curb weight figure hovering around the one and a half ton mark which makes them significantly heavier than the conventional Focus or Megane style family hatches they're based upon. That in turn means quite an efficiency downside if you're thinking of switching from a conventional hatch to an SUV model like this one. With a Kajar, that's not such a big issue, mainly because the CMF platform it sits upon has been designed to be as light as possible. Renault reckons that it's around 40 kilos lighter than a conventional chassis, and as a result, this model tips the scales at only a fraction over 1,300 kilos in the petrol-powered form we're trying here. In comparison to, say, an equivalent Volkswagen Tiguan or a Honda CRV, you're saving somewhere between 150 and 250 kilos. In other words, a reduction equivalent to the saving you'd probably make if you'd asked your entire family to get out and walk. You'll be wanting some figures, so let's give you some. The stats we're going to quote here are WLTP ones, but they've been converted back to the most recent new European driving cycle, or NEDC2 spec, since that's what a lot of rival models are still using. We'll start with the 1.3 litre petrol models that most customers will probably want and the TCE 140 manual variant. This manages up to 44.1 mpg on the combined cycle and 134 grams per kilometre of CO2. With the EDC Auto Gearbox, a TCE 140 manages up to 43.5 mpg and 131 grams per kilometre. This TCE 160 manual derivative delivers very similar results, 42.8 mpg and 136 grams per kilometre. Opt for the blue DCI 115 diesel and with manual transmission you're looking at 113 grams per kilometre and up to 60.1 mpg which combined with this car's 52 litre fuel tank gives a potential driving range of over 750 miles. We'll also give you the efficiency figures for the blue DCI 115 EDC Auto up to 57.7 mpg and 111 grams per kilometre of CO2. With all the mainstream Kajar models, you're looking at a benefit in kind taxation rate of no more than 27 or 28%. Obviously, you'll be taxed more heavily if you go for the larger 1.7 litre blue DCI 150 diesel engine, which in four wheel drive form puts out 138 grams per kilometre. Of course, the efficiency of this car isn't just down to clever engine tweaks and weight savings. There's a stop and start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Kinetic energy is recovered and stored in the battery under braking and deceleration. Plus, there's a dashboard eco switch that restricts pulling power for more frugal returns. The sleek shape helps too, with underbody fairings and deflectors beneath the car that steer airflow away from turbulence inducing wheel arches. There's even an active flap on the front air intake so that cooling air is channeled to the engine only when required. And top models get LED front headlamps and fog lights with energy consumption that's six times lower than with ordinary halogen lamps. 
drivers need to do their part too, you might want to configure the TFT dashboard screen in its Style 3 economy setting, which gives you a bracketed eco section in the 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock section of the instrument gauge. Stay in that and you'll maximise economy. If you've a variant fitted with the R-Link 2 infotainment screen, there's a driving Eco 2 menu that offers a whole range of options based around a couple of tuition segments that'll help you improve your driving efficiency. Standard and Advanced both give you an overall global score for all efficiency-related areas of your driving. And in the Standard section, you can access a graphical score evolution graph showing your recent progress in that regard. Plus, the car also records the distance travelled without fuel consumption, though we're not quite sure why you need to know that. In the advanced section, it's a bit simpler with straightforward star scorings for your efforts in terms of acceleration, gear changing and anticipation. You also get the option to access some so-called eco-coaching tips, though personally we wouldn't, because some of them are rather blindingly obvious. For example, try not to accelerate too hard, you will not lose much time and you will save a lot of fuel. Enough on efficiency figures, what about the other costs of running this car? Depreciation, for example. We might be surprised by how well the Kajar does here. Industry experts cap reckon that after three years and 60,000 miles, a typical Kajar TCE 160 iconic variant, like the one we're trying here, will still be worth £8,850, which is very class competitive. Buyers of this car may well make some savings in insurance costs too. The best you can do is get a 1.5 litre blue DCI 115 version of this model rated to group 17E. It's 19E or 20E for the base TCE 140 petrol model or group 21E for the TCE 160 petrol variant we're trying here. The four-year warranty looks good too, given that most rivals restrict you to three-year cover. Bear in mind though that the final two years of the policy restrict you to 100,000 miles. You get four years of UK emergency breakdown recovery and three years worth of European cover as part of this package. Finally, scheduled servicing is every 12 months or 18,000 miles for diesels and every 24 months or 18,000 miles for petrol variants. As usual, prepaid servicing plans are available. It'll certainly help that the ecological oil filter needs replacing only every 18,000 miles and the timing chain is maintenance free. The timing belt requires changing only every 100,000 miles and the close coupled diesel particulate filter has been designed to last the lifetime of the car. The one thing we haven't talked about is that name. North African tribe, Middle Eastern trade wind, wrong and wrong. Apparently, it's one of those portmanteau French words where CAD is inspired by the word quad, the casual term for a four-wheeled all-terrain vehicle, and jar is a reference to the French words agile and gelier, which means to emerge quickly. A touch ironic, that, given that this French brand has taken so long to establish itself in this profitable family crossover segment. Still, there are advantages to turning up late to any party, and the Kajar has made the very most of them, especially in this improved form. Building on the market credibility the brand has already earned with its smaller capture crossover model, it takes pretty much everything that's good about the segment-leading Nissan Qashqai and clothes those elements in a sleek, slightly more spacious package that's a little more affordably priced. Other competitors aren't as easy on the eye and many struggle to match this Renault when it comes to issues like running costs and practicality. As for the changes made to this revised version, well, the important news is that the petrol power, previously a weak link in this model range, is now very much a strength. Perhaps just as importantly from a showroom point of view, the cabin, which previously struggled to justify the price of upper spec models, now feels wholly appropriate to this car's price point. Are there issues? Well, it's true that this car could certainly still be a little sharper to drive, but that's partly down to the fact that, rather refreshingly, Renault has tuned the handling for comfort rather than some misguided sense of perceived sportiness. 
Families will appreciate that, we think, and the few that want to occasionally venture off tarmac will be relieved to find that the option of four-wheel drive, now deleted on this car's Qashqai cousin, has been retained in the Qajar range. In summary, well, you could say that it would have been difficult for Renault to fail with this SUV, given the proven underpinnings it's based upon. For a decade, though, this French brand had the right ingredients for a model like this, but failed to blend them together into an appropriate car for the crossover crowd. Now that it has, the brand was never going to risk spoiling things by making too many far-reaching changes. But the updates made here have been timely and well judged. This Kajar may not be the ultimate urban adventurer, the ads claim, but it's the kind of car that really could add a more appealing dimension to family travel.